Did you crawl anything? I didn't crawl, but I have to do so the, uh, sorry, the, you guys keep the router for two weeks or so until everybody's done with yeah. two or three and we're all done, then yeah. you can. Okay. okay. A few doubts? Yeah. Basic, but important. But, uh, so are you able to crawl? How, how many things we crawl? All of it? Not yet? I just started uh, testing the six. Seats? Oh yeah, so, I'm sorry about that. Some people got the seats late. For most of you who got the seats late, that's not my fault. It's your fault. But for some of you, it's my fault. And if you need two more days or so to finish the crawling, that's okay. I don't intend to do penalties for being late unless the TAs cannot cover it. But it seems like we have enough TAs for the number of students. So if if somebody's late for, you know, not, not always late, but sometimes late, that's okay. Um, I did that on thousands of tools. How fast? I mean, I'm using the Spappy framework, so uh -huh. it's not taking too much interest. Right, right. But are you obeying politeness? Yeah, I see. Okay. I think some of these frameworks do it. You, you, have, to, you have to like few classes or you have to set few parameters oh, and stuff like that. So. I thought I thought by default they, they do it. Uh, like following now, uh, now by default starting the latest version has started obeying the following trust. Yeah. I, I mean I've never to be honest with you, I never use such yeah. a thing, but I, that's what I know. Uh, okay. So any other questions about homework three? Something that does not require like code debugging. So what are out, what are actually outlines? Valid outlines? Because when you when you give a URL, you get a list of URLs, right, from a web page. Yeah. Then uh, you canonicalize all the URLs to remove all the URLs which are referring to within the page. So that you have from set one. Now, are these? So outlinks refers to the for each document for each web page links that are pointing to other documents from that document. And um, you, you're not going to be able to, you can capture all of them, because if I crawl a document, I can tell which was the outlinks from it. So I can store those outlinks somewhere. But, will, but there will be some but of some those URLs did. which will not obey, I mean, which will have robots.txt, I mean, uh, saying you can't crawl them. Right, right. So, so you, you may not end up with all the, if you were to think of the outlinks, so I have a, a page ID, and I have the HTML, and I have the clean text, and I have here our links. These are elastic search fields. In the elastic search field in here, I have, I think it's a square bracket, link one, link two, up to link n. Capturing those in a, in a URL format, it's easy, from the page, page itself. Yeah. Now you're saying some of these I'm not actually going to have in my crawl. Like uh, some of these, they will be, uh, they'll be outside my crawl for various purposes. One is maybe has a robots.txt policy and I choose not to crawl that. Another is maybe it's not a robots.txt, but I decided that's a PDF document and I don't want to index PDF document. Another thing might be when I do the frontier management, I decide to not do that page because every time I organize the frontier management, the, the queue of URLs, I'll have more queue. Very quickly, you'll get more links than you actually need to crawl. So you have a stopping at 20,000 or 30,000 documents, but your queue might be 100,000 documents. So it might be one of those 70,000 that I did not crawl. Not because of the robots.txt, but because I simply didn't get to it. Right. So I think there's many reasons for some, for 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 which some of these links you'll see them and you can state the link, but you do not have the content of that page. Now we do not require necessarily. I'm not sure how the TAs do this, but we not require you to crawl uh, everything that's listed here. Okay. I, actually, it's impossible you will have some links for which you don't have the content. What we do require is the following. If you are in the team with me 
and you have this dead link, from your point of view, disappears dead. Yeah. Because you didn't crawl that, but you, you, you say the link. You have this document, right? You have this document, and you see this link. If I crawl this document for whatever reason, maybe I break the robots.txt you know, policy and I get it anyway. In the team index, you have to have this as an alive link. Like when you put everything together, if I get the destination documents and you got the source document that has the link to it, you have to have that link. Now we have both documents in the index, so the link has to be there. Now, in practice, when you're gonna get to web graphs, maybe we talk a little bit today about web graphs uh, towards the end of the lecture, it's not feasible to build a reasonable web graph for just a few seeds and 20,000 documents. So the hope of having all the edges in a graph, all the links, uh, that, that's just not feasible. Unless you crawl something very, very closed, like, like there's some few pages that point to each other, like a farm, and you get all of them, and there's very few links outside that, and you just skip some of them. Uh, uh, you know, getting the picture of the full web graph, it's not doable with this. So homework four, I think it's available. Uh, we'll ask you to do uh, a web graph measurement on two graphs. One is a graph that you extract from your links, and one is a web graph that we give uh, from a collection of documents that's closed. So for that, those documents, I forgot how many they are, we can get all the links in between them and construct a web graph with those. It's kind of an academic toy exercise. It's not realistic, but that, that graph, it's close. And we also know the answers. When you measure page rank on that academic toy data set, we know what pages should have the high page rank because people have been using it for a long time. But for your crawl, you're going to produce a web graph next week, and then you're going to say measure page rank. People have got very weird results like some legal documents in Wikipedia, like these this side notes, like, like you know, the, the, there's a little legal note at the end of Wikipedia legal document. That has a high, high, very high page rank because every, every document points to that one in effect, right? Every document has a link to that one. Yeah. So, um, so if, you think if that is a dead link, now in the graph in which we are going to produce as a T, so will that be there in the graph or if it is a dead link? Right? Uh, when we talk about the web graph, we, we have to organize the graph. Again, I, I don't want to talk about the web graph right now. I want to talk after the break because I have a few things to say about the crawlers first. There is this, this inner core of the web graph for which we have the inner links. Everything in here is alive. But there's other links from the web graph, something that supports to the outside, to some document that I don't have. Right. So when we when we talk about the web graph, we have to understand that there will be some things unless we crawl everything, which e even for Google that's not the actual goal of crawling to get everything. There's too many dynamic pages that cannot be put up in, in a way that satisfies page rank. There's e out links that go dead, and there's in links from outside that we don't have. So this, it is true that those links have an impact to measures like page rank. If you would keep your documents the way it is, but you add other documents or delete other documents, you would change the page rank, sometimes in a significant way. Uh, so in practice, in, in, in reality, people have studied this problem. Is there a way to estimate or approximate not the documents, but how many documents are outside. It can, is there a way when I crawl to keep track of certain things and have a sort of estimate how many documents are outside my core crawl? I think they call it a base set. Right? Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to say whatever it's live, it's live. What we don't have, we don't have. What students did in previous years was to resize the crawl to say, OK, I've got 70,000 documents or 80,000 documents in my team. There's a team that crawl like 800,000 documents just to get a much bigger graph in there. I think that's something you can try if you have the time and the resources. Uh, these things can get complicated pretty fast. Why I'm asking that because if, 
if at all, if you have to remove, what usually, I mean, in all these frameworks or libraries, what do they do? I mean, they check for robots or TXT just before they are actually going to get that particular web page. Yeah. If you want to do this, then right before even I schedule or to do the actual get page, I have to do an extra call. Anyway, it's not an extra call. I have to do a call of to a robots or TXT or any other for valid reasons to check whether it is. Uh, yeah, but robots or TXT. Am I correct that it's it's a domain thing? It's yes. like uh, wikipedia.org slash robots.txt. So you would cache those things, right? You don't, you're not going to read it multiple times. Everything that's wikipedia.org in the URL, you know I've read this robots.txt already. So you would cache it. So for all the URLs that have wikipedia.org in them, you would only read robots.txt once, right? So I, you can do, if you want to solve a little bit of this problem, you can limit by domain. What I've seen people doing, even in uh, uh, academic papers, academic papers are in between class work, what you guys doing, and reality, which is the industry. Academic papers are a little bit more advanced than class projects, but they're not on par with reality, with what Google or Bing do. So in academic papers, sometimes when you do crawling, they limit the number of domains they hit. So it's a focus crawl that says, uh, I'm only going to hit at most 3,000 domains. And some of them are by hand. So I'm going to impose that out of those 3,000, the following 120, things like wikipedia.org, you know, and yahoo.com, and so on and so forth, those are included. And then I, when I hit 3,000 domains, I stop. So the robots of this is really not a problem because it's only 3,000 volts. There. So, Calculating outlinks is, I mean, is relatively simpler, but calculating inlinks might be. You mean listing inlinks, uh, not calculating. Uh, listing inlinks, uh, because there might be, like, my goal or what I'm planning to do is now, since we have to write to a single elastic, elastic search, so I don't want to write into my elastic search and then again read it and send it. I would rather uh, write an XML document and then use the same parser which. Uh, that's okay with me. Yeah, and it's up to you to yeah. But in that case, so when you do when you're writing an XML document, I would write an XML document as soon as I process one link as like that. But in that case, my at that point of time, my my in link might be a wrong con because there might be further document which might have actually. That's always going to be a problem whether you do XML or Elasticsearch with in links. Yeah. You're always going to see a link from your document, your current document is going somewhere. And you don't have this document yet, and you don't know if you're going to crawl it or your teammate is going to crawl well, it. Well, I have I've already have the document. If you already have it, it's easy. Already. If you already have it, it's easy to say there's an in-link to you, buddy. Right? The problem is if you don't have it, how are you going to know when you get to it later or your teammates get to it later, how are they going to know, hey, somebody saw this link before? Are we all on the same page no, but here? I've already written the file for that particular. Yeah, but you see this link now. You write it down somewhere. So maybe. my logic is, is it OK to have an XML file and then separate file for links and outlinks? Why would you need an XML file? To store all the others. Uh, oh, OK. Yeah, it's fine. I think most people that I've seen uh, not, uh, the issue here is not getting it done. There's so many ways to get this kind of assignment done. The issue here is doing it in a clean, straight way so you don't have to come back to it, fix it, doesn't work, fix it, doesn't work, fix, you know? So the cleanest way I've seen was to create an Elasticsearch individual index and some additional file with all the links in it. Uh, similar to the file that you're getting in Homework 4, there is a file with all those links. And then once you merge the team indexes, Go through all these three files, if there are three people in the team, go to the three files and put the in-links and out-links in there. That's what I think. It's, it maybe takes a little bit more time, but I, I don't think those students who did this had any back and forth. Now, it's completely up to you. We're not gonna, he's not going to ask whether you have an XML or additional files, uh, you know, whatever. You should talk to your teammates about this. Hey, how do we deal with this problem? And uh, you said to check for a few keywords in an anchor text or an URL. So, I mean, 
even if like I'm I've just done thousand documents, but even if I'm thinking like for twenty thousand documents, like how many it's going to be a hard search saying if the keyword exists then take this URL. If not, don't. So like how how many keywords like that approximately we need to have to um so when you promote in the frontier management, when you promote a URL, you decided, okay, I have a queue, it's FIFO. So I don't have to change the order, but in most cases, it's, it's advantageous to change the order. You have to have some sort of accumulator score that gives points for certain things. If the document comes or has keywords that I've listed, you know, it's plus something. What you're saying is if the link itself, the anchor text, the anchor text is not the link, is the yeah. text in the source document. Yeah. Okay. If that has keywords that are good, that should be a huge promotion. Usually anchor text words are known to be far more relevant to the link than anything else. Okay, but, but you're not saying that if the, if the keywords are not present in anchor text, you know that. Yeah. What I would do, I would take that FIFO queue and I would say frontier management go through all documents, they have already an order by the previous frontier management output, right? I would, I would add some sort of promotion based on various factors, like, okay, if you, you're scoring everybody in the frontier list, right? If you have a keyword, one of my keywords, into the anchor text, plus 100. If you have uh, uh, one of my keywords into the link itself, you know, I don't know, plus 50. If you have, um, uh, if I've seen the domain it's pointing to, right, it's pointing to some domain, and in that domain I've already got promoted some links, promote this one too. This is a trial and error thing. You're gonna have to play with that frontier management. If you end up with, what do you say, 20,000 documents? Is it, or 30,000? 20. 20,000. Uh, some of you, will not need to do a lot of frontier management because the URLs, the seed URLs, are very specific. By crawling from there, you stay within the relevance uh, of the topic. But some of you will not. And then, I think the purpose is within 10 to 20,000 documents, we want to have about three or 4,000 good. So when you put a query in, I, I think it's home or five, when you put a query and you want to see relevant documents. Suppose I got World War II. If I ask about firebombing of England, there was a big event in World War II, right? I should get some documents in Elasticsearch that have this, that are positively correlated or relevant to this topic. The, the, what I want to prevent is to have 20,000 documents with the seeds URL and almost nothing else that's relevant. In a, in a focus role or topic role, we you don't want to go at large and just get everything. How are you measuring like how many documents are there for this topic? You can't unless you look at it with human eyes, right? I, I mean if you have click through data, you can approximate the human eyes by saying how many people click on these documents. But uh, what we're going to do in Homework 5, we're going to put some queries related to your topic. And you're going to have to rank top documents from your crawl. It's like vertical search, right? It's focused on a certain domain. And in that domain, it does the crawling, the indexing, the searching. So you put a query. You get a list of documents. And you're going to have to go with human eyes over these documents, but not all of them. Of course, you can rank all 60, 70,000 documents that you crawled, but we're not going to do that. We're going to go to, say, I don't know, 100 of them or so. So I think we're going to get an impression over whether you get relevant documents by asking three queries. So if your, your three queries will be related to your topic. If your topic is World War II, we're going to get some queries about events in World War II. In fact, I already have the queries I used last year. And in this topic, for each query, you're going to list a bunch of uh, documents. That's where you're going to need a web plugin to display those links from Elasticsearch. And then what you need to do with your teammates, go over this link, these documents, and judge them 
by human eyes mark them good or bad for that query. So again, the setup is, if your topic is World War II, I ask about firebombing of England, I get a bunch of documents, I get a list, there's a checkbox that you have to implement that says yes, no, yes, no, relevant, not relevant, in a binary fashion. And you have to go through about 100 or 200 of them. For three queries, that's 600. Assuming you can spend about, I don't know, 20 seconds a document to decide, this, this exercise will take about three, four hours to get through all 200 times three queries, 600, and mark them relevant, not relevant. So we'll do a little bit of that, but we can't get it to 20,000. Okay. I also incorporate certain pages like from Wikipedia, which is actually one URL is focusing on the main page, and one URL is focusing on the edit page of the main page. But when you do a URL with canonicalization, you get the same. both a yeah. different URL can, so they consider as different pages. Well, I mean, canon canonicalization is up to you. I think it would be good to skip the even the edit stuff, where the Wikipedia page edit something. Yeah, I would I would ignore those. I would just get the recent one, because we are not dealing with freshness in homework three. So we or edit history or anything like that. You just need the, the current document. Yeah. He woke up in the mood today. Anybody else? <laughs> Okay, so, so the expectation of merging is like everyone, every team member has to write to the elastic search at the same time. Is that the, expect the same time we can't we can really judge. So okay. it may be that you write today and he writes tomorrow over your index. But what we expect is for you before you do whatever to check is this document in an index already? Okay. Do I have to fix links? I, I don't expect you guys to do it literally in the same time. It would be nice to write. Uh, an interface, this, this protocol that you communicate with the team index. So you don't depend on whether my teammate did it before me or after me. You have to imagine a distributed environment. There's like so many crawler agents, right? And everybody reads and writes from an index. You don't know whether you're the first one to write or the second one or the last one or some other agent will write at the same time with you. So there's concurrency problems. Or uh, can you get a lock? Can I get a lock to the index right now? I do my operations, release the lock, so then the other agent can do something. I think it'd be nice to think a little bit about how would this work in a distributed environment where it's not just three, it's like 3,000 agents that are communicating with an index. How, how do you do it? If you want to take on that, you can. But for now, you can do it. You do it now, and then your teammate does it after, and then the third person does it after. But even if you first, you have to have some checks yeah. before you decide what to write. You know, cannot assume I'm first, so it's empty, so just move my stuff in. Yeah. Okay. Um, Some slides. Be before we go over the slides quickly, this is a little bit of a recap, but also some some new discussion. Um, what was the big plan in here for the problem? We have this queue. And this has a frontier management. Uh, frontier management, it's very specific to the purpose of your crawl. If you are Google, you prioritize your, your crawling needs differently than if you are a student in this class. Even though the crawl is much bigger, you have to know, OK, why do I promote certain URLs? What's my purpose? That your purpose is to satisfy relevance, to help getting more documents related to your topic. Because the crawler will have, every crawler has the problem that 
the Q expands very, very quickly. So by the link, the wave number two of BFS or three, you're gonna have a lot of URLs in there. And since you're only crawling so much, you wanna get relevant stuff. So your, your, your purpose here is relevance. That's what you wanna do. So from here, what did we say? We get a URL, right? And then, what was the next box? HTML calls. That's a head and robots and then get. And then, what did we have? Process is going here somewhere. process this HTML into content links other things my need uh, I think here I used to have this get some of them back to the queue and this stuff gets into my index. Okay. So that's what we had last time. What are the tricky parts for you here? Some of the things in here are easy because you're going to use a library or you're going to use Elasticsearch. And some of the things you have to worry about. One thing that we talked about is this frontier management. That's going to be a major piece. How do I look at all my URLs? And I'm happy if you choose to ignore the natural FIFO order. If you have a FIFO order, typically people don't want to change completely the FIFO order. Remember what I said last time? You want to change globally few URLs. You want to say for few URLs, I can promote it all the way to the top. And for most URLs, I'm only going to rank them within a few ranks. I'm going to allow local re-ranking, but not global re-ranking. So if I have 20,000 URLs in there in my queue, I'm going to allow for, say, 100 of them to move anywhere, and for everybody else to move only up to 200 ranks. So that's the theory. In practice, you can do whatever you want here if you increase the relevance, if you, if you get enough relevant content for your topic, which should be easy. Those topics that I gave you, there's a lot of documents about them. It's not like there's lack of, of information about World War II or Catholic Church or anything like that. You can break that principle and re-rank almost everything if you want to ignore the FIFO queue. That's okay. So that's one major piece that you're going to have to think really hard how is it that I'm promoting the URL? In particular, you may want to produce a list of keywords that are relevant, whether they're in anchor text or whether they are in the content itself. Or maybe in the meta, you know, those pages have, most of them are organized in title, references, uh, you know, content, tags. Finding within the tags some of these keywords might be a strong indication of relevance. It, it, almost certainly is. If you see a tag that's, you know, World War II, and your topic is World War II, that's definitely an indication of your own. So that's one piece, frontier management. Where else am I going to get in trouble with this one more trick? Uh, we said that the uh, outlinks, so here, 
the outlinks requires a plan. The inlinks are easy, but the outlinks requires a plan and a discussion with your teammates. How are we going to do this? Where we store the links? How we bring them back to the team index and all that? I, I don't think it's hard engineering-wise. It's probably just a few lines of code to do this. But I think you need to, to worry about how does our links go into my index properly? What else? We talked about the politeness. And I can tell you that unless you do something really crazy, you're not going to get in trouble. So if you ignore robots.txt for some domains, again, back in the day, a few years ago, we caused a big problem for the university in this course that they almost shut down the internet access to it. But I think that if you are reasonable, you, even if you don't follow all those robots TXT perfectly, you're not going to get in trouble. You should not crawl like a machine gun. You should allow some minimal delay, especially between calls to the same domain. So that should be easy. What else could be difficult here? Um, starting to crawl documents in different languages in Wikipedia. Right, right. So, as I said, I think already last time, we're going to allow as a minimum requirement to ignore things that doesn't look like nice English. Now, it would be very, that, that's a big challenge. It, it's not, not just other languages, but you're going to see PDFs, songs, images, and even HTML in a structured form. You, you're talking about Spanish or Chinese, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the one was like, well, but yeah, it was like some country. There's a bunch of countries. Yeah. So there, there's two levels of what he, the point he's making. One level is, does it have Latin writings or ASCII characters that my computer understands? If it does, perhaps it can be in Spanish. Like, the, well, where, why you couldn't crawl a Spanish document? But again, that's not required for the homework. If you detect Spanish, you can ignore it as far as the grading is concerned. But why, why, where in all this pipeline of Spanish document will be difficult? Why couldn't I just crawl a Spanish document? Who, who stops me? I mean, Elasticsearch doesn't know it's in Spanish. Right? When I match keywords for promoting URLs, I would have some. I would have to have some Spanish keywords. In some cases, that's not necessary. If if I'm looking for a location, or like I'm Adolf Hitler, right? In Spanish and English is the same name, right? But if I'm looking for something that has a translation in Spanish, I may have to have some keywords in Spanish. That's not very difficult to look to your list of keywords and and come up with the Spanish. I mean. I, I would expect you would have like 20 or 30 keywords. So how hard could it be to translate some of these keywords in Spanish if you want to? That's not so hard. So if it has a writing, an encoding that your pipeline can handle, it's not so hard to include, say, Spanish documents. But if there's Asian languages, or it breaks some, some of the other things in the pipeline, definitely not going to work. And then if you have images or songs or, or uh, PDFs, you would have to have somewhere a very different processing mechanism, right? And on the HTML, there is a lang attribute and then uh, like constant type, would that be helpful? Yeah, yeah so I, I think if uh, that's the easiest way to detect, uh, it's not, I don't think it's that specific. I don't think from there alone you can tell what document is, but in most cases, if it's a plain text and if it's English, you should accept it. I, I, I'm okay with you guys ignoring things like, especially images and PDFs. If you want to include more than one language, I think it's relatively easy if it's written in the same kind of phonetics that that, um, that English is, like same kind of characters, wording, tokens, because Asian languages work differently. Um, Another thing, a very relevant question that I have, by the way, this is a huge problem that you can make a lot of money with if, if you know how to solve it. Suppose I do have HTML pages written in English. Is there sometimes something in those pages that is hard to crawl? 
you know, you know what? We have certain texts which are in different languages. Like even in Wikipedia, people So it's in English? No, it's not in English. Suppose it's in English. What well, I'm asking is English documents, not the question of English or sign English. If you want to break the captcha and say, am I a robot? No. Right, so how do you pass through firewalls and tests like captchas uh, or memberships, right? Sometimes there's a membership you have to sign in. Yeah. You know, how do you sign in? I'm not, I'm not talking about that. Suppose I do have access. It's a document. It's web. It's English, okay? It doesn't have images. Is there something that micro will fail on? Some content hidden by JavaScript? That's dynamic content. Yeah. Sure, I don't mean that. If the content is there. If the JavaScript, it's not too hard to implement something in your crawler to get the JavaScript concept co 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 content, right? It's down to access. If, you, if that doesn't require a special sort of access, it's easy in your crawler to put a call to get the JavaScript content if you want. But what is the content right in front of you that you can read it as a human if you render the page, but if you crawl it with this pipeline, not going to look that good or not going to be that usable? Uh, some content that is displayed in pictures, like titles and headlines or sometimes In pictures. picture? Yeah. So that... Right, so maybe. if I ignore the pictures, I lose that. If I if I know I have a lot of content in pictures, I have to use something called OCR, right? To detect, especially like things like captions that were embedded in the movie. How do I get the captions out of it? I need OCR. Or if I have a lot of documents that I know they've been scanned, right? Uh, OCR is very good today. You can add that to your crawler if you want. There's libraries that you can just call. You don't have to implement them. But I don't mean that. That's already in the picture realm. So the same thing I could say about the song, right? Is the guy's singing in the song, what is he saying? Can you, can you get the words, the lyrics of the song just by listening to the MP3 file? Same kind of thing like OCR, right? I don't mean that. I mean something that you, as a human eyes, wouldn't have no problem. Is there some content in HTML that once you crawl it, my question is a lot simpler than you guys think. If it's plain text, it's fine, right? I get the text. And I, I clean it up, I get it, send it to Elasticsearch. Can the stuff in an HTML page not be plain text? What about table? Like an HTML table? Yeah. Everything that's organized, oh, yeah. not in plain text. I could get the content of the table, I could get the words that are in the table, but it will make no sense written as words. Right? Imagine this table has rows and columns and I, I get the text row by row or column by column. When I get it back, it's not something searchable or useful. Right? So it, you have to pay attention or, or if, the, if the page has a certain structure, you know, code snippets sometimes, uh, that you can click on something, open that thing. Or, or pop-ups, that you, the information is there, if you put the mouse somewhere, it shows a pop-up. All those things make a lot of sense to human eye when you see them. In fact, that's how they are designed, to help the human eye. But if you index it as plain text, it would make a lot less sense when you were doing something with your crawler or your, the information you've got, say you want to retrieve it, say you want to search it. Put a query, you're going to get the words, and you retrieve that stream of words from a table, that's not going to mean anything for whoever's reading this. This is a well-known problem. How do I parse documents that I know the formats, like HTML, but they have some structure in them which is not the typical HTML, like a table. See, in XML or in JSON, I don't have this problem. Why is that? In XML or JSON, everything is formatted. I, it's a consistent formatting thing. That, that's how JSON came along, because people were this pissed off with HTML. So if I have everywhere the structure, like in a hash with keys or whatever, it's easy, because I, I follow that structure. But in HTML, there is no 
even in a table, there's so many formats for tables, even if you read the HTML table, you cannot, it's no immediate way of how to index a table to retrieve back the information. This is a problem, you'd be amazed how many small companies or small institutions have this problem. They have a lot of content. They started with a plain format. I, I'm familiar with medical records. In medical records, they started with a medical format. They thought that's a note. The doctor's going to say, write, or dictate the note, whatever. And guess what? With time, people feel like putting tables or bullets or issues. And now, if you pass those notes without taking into account the, the little formatting that's a table, you're not going to be able later on to retrieve or present the proper information. Um, another good example for this is PDFs. That's another open problem. How do we parse a PDF? Now, PDFs are much harder than HTML documents because you have to get to the underlying structure of the PDF. But when you do, the problem with a lot of PDFs is that they have embedded a lot of fonts, figures. Uh, I'm not talking about the picture, the JPEG picture that's included as it is. I'm talking about the vectorial, this, uh, you know, so some of the vectorial formats that PDFs allows, that allows you to do drawings, headings, complicated things. I know at least two companies, uh, not companies, uh, but, but institutions, who were looking very hard to find somebody who can parse their own PDFs by taking into account uh, things like citation, references, tables, and catalog the fi figures that are in there. And that turned out to be a hard thing to do. So I think in HTML, the, the same thing would happen in here. What's easy, it's easy, and uh, the many libraries who can clean HTML give you the text and the links. But what about the table? Or some other things that text is readable, it's just not, uh, once it becomes a stream of words, it's not that useful. Okay. Could you process like the entire document in like a JSON or an XML format? Like if it was everything. originally, no, I mean not for the homework in general. I mean um, the whole document header everything into like a JSON, like every content of the document does an XML or a JSON itself. Including the HTML, everything. Like yeah, but but then it would be easier. I guess. I'm not sure. No, you can put it in XML format. Suppose you succeed hundred percent, then what? Well, then the normal indexing of the JSON itself as a whole. But that's still based on tokens, right? Indexing the way we studied in homework one and two loses that structure. The moment you transform a set of documents into an inverted file list, is token, right, remember? Yeah. Document ID, count, position. How are you going to know this guy is part of a table, it's the row three and column five in that table? I mean, you'd have to add this information to the index and later on have a way to recover the table, similar with proximity search, right? If I want to say, find me something that looks like a table with the following headers. I mean, like something like there was an extra part that said you can index the header and the rest of the content and be able to retrieve both separately. Yeah, but I don't think with a table that's naturally easy to do. If I have a document that's split into three parts, part one, part two, part three, I can index three fields, part one text, part two text, part three text. About the table, what do I do? How do I know that this is organized? This value, it's in the same column like that the other value. The, a key value pair would work, but key value pairs are not natural for inverted files, right? Why not have like specific structure like when you're Passing or scraping this thing. So if you were like these are since these are well known problems, so if it is a table, it has to be a 2D table or like or one. So you have a structure just to represent it. So it may be in a JSON. But then how do I search? Somebody gives me a keyword. I have to create some some indexing for the table, right? I have to create some sort of indexing mechanism specific for the table. To say, okay, that's a table or say the following keyword appears in the following tables, in the following columns, in the following rows. So then if you ask that query, I, can, I know that's the table I want to return. I'm not, I'm not saying it's impossible, 
I'm saying it's not immediate to just say process the HTML, see what happens. Tables won't work like that. And tables is like the easiest example for that. Even small tables. I mean, you got the words, but not in a useful way. When you try to get them back, that's not going to be easy. Uh, we're dragging this too much. It's not like you're going to do something about it. Uh, <laughs> let's see what else is in here. So some stuff that it's blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go very quick through those things. What coverage means? It's not for a focus crawl. It's for a general crawl. If I'm Google, I need to address the issue of coverage. Your problem in this homework for a focus crawl, coverage relates to what we're going to study next week, recall. If I get 20,000 documents on my topic, my topic is American Independence War. How many of them are relevant? How many of them are good? Right? I already said I would like at least 20% of your documents to be on topic or related to the topic. And I'm, I'm OK with 80% or less being just random stuff around. In that sense, if I crawl 60,000 documents, I'm going to end up with 12 to 15,000 documents that are good. As you probably know from data from machine learning, there's two types of errors when I'm trying to get something. False positives and false negatives. In IR, we have no problems with false positives usually. So if, if, if we crawl more documents that we need, we need 12,000 relevant and we crawl 100,000, so we have 87,000, that's fine. We let for the retrieval functions and for the search mechanism the problem of sorting stuff out. The immediate problems of the focus crawler is the false negatives. If you miss stuff right now and you don't crawl it, it doesn't matter what happens later, right? Because you're not going to have that. If you miss a particular document or a set of documents about something important, they're gone. Crawlers have this problem that you can get more than what you need, and that's not a problem because you sort it out later, but if you miss information, you missed it and it's missed for good, nothing later on can recover it. We have this problem in a lot of uh, medical documents. Uh, I don't know how many of you are Americans, but if you are, you know about the VA hospital, veteran... Uh, uh, yeah, no, no bueno. What? No bueno. Yeah. So. The, they, um, they collected data for a long time in almost every state for all the veterans, right? So they have literally hundreds of millions of records of all the people who went to Fort Worth since like 1900s. So now they have a recall problem for any, any uh, research project they want to do. So VA is the core VA, which is doctors taking care of patients, of course. But this is they have all this data that's very good for research especially because medical research has to do with time evolution. You can't do medical research right now. You have to look at back the last 10 years or 15 years, 20 years. So VA data is perfect for that. So why they call me in? They have the following recall problem. We have databases of 100 million records. We only need 10,000 that have the following property. We're okay to get more than 10,000. Initial, initial pull from the database. They don't have an index. They have a SQL database. So initial pull from the database. They don't mind if instead of 10,000, I pull 20,000 or 30,000, just like you could pull a lot more documents than the ones you need. But they don't want to miss anything. So they study things like PTSDs or certain diabetes uh, problems or certain um, myeloma. It's a certain type of cancers, right? And they say, we want all of these. And if you bring more, that, that's the false positives ones, that's OK. Making sure you're getting all the cases, relevant cases, even though you get more stuff, it's extremely hard. Their computers cannot handle that request. When I put the request, computer crashed. Because they, they, the database they have is way too big. The documents they need in the end, it's only 10,000 or 12,000. But for me to make sure I'm getting everything relevant, I need to look through almost all the database, right? So they have exactly this problem. How do I make sure I don't miss stuff in the beginning? That's the typical problem of a focus job. Do they have a database backup or not? 
they do, the problem is VA has been around for so long and there's so many architectures and ways of implementing stuff that the people who created the backups from 30 years ago, they aren't around anymore. So they know there's a backup, but now the current databases are backed up in a different way. So for the old ones, nobody, or almost nobody I talk to knows how to access those. In principle, there should be a transfer of you know, knowledge between generations, between when people retire and so on and so forth. But you know, the government doesn't work like that. I'm, I'm not criticizing the government. I think they're much better organized than military hospitals in other countries. Still, there'll be amazing access to information, medical information, much more than MGH or some other local hospital, yet it's incredibly hard to pull the data out. And even they, they cannot do it, doctors. They don't know how. They only know their cases, but they don't know what the guy before did. Yeah, I heard a story about a closet and whatnot. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. And, and security, it's paranoid. For a good reason, you can understand that military information about soldiers, it's something really that you don't want to leak out, of course. But it makes it extremely hard to do computer-related tasks because security gets in the way. Uh, anyway. So coverage. The other issue that you don't have at all, but why? This is like look to you, right? With this this place here. So you won't have the freshness problem, um, but but a commercial problem will definitely have it. That is, how often can I update certain pages? Uh, one of the issues is that different pages require different update rates. And so you cannot just have everybody gets updated once a week. That doesn't work, right? Uh, especially if there's a source of information that's about, say, an ongoing document. You need to update it literally within seconds. Suppose there's a soccer game and people want to ask for the results or something. Right? You cannot just wait three days to update the result. Or if there's an emergency somewhere in the world and there's a crisis, a flooding, or, or something, right? Now this got much better. It used to be that it all depends on the crowd. Now there is this notifications that uh, there is a way for, say, Facebook or, or some you know, game to notify directly the Google agents about changes, so Google doesn't have to poke on that, on that site all the time. So it got much better. But freshness it's a, used to be a problem until relatively recently. How do I update some things very fast and some things I have to identify things like, say, a course page. It doesn't change that often. So I, I don't need to update it every day. Poland, as we talk about this, basic crawler. Um, here's a little bit that you don't have to worry about. I, I think the way you would implement the crawler, you don't have to worry about DNS server because the get automatically does that for you. But you know, every domain name is mapped into an IP with numbers, so you actually have to call an IP. HTTP, get, head, um, URL extraction is typically part of this, right? You would call some library that would extract the text and the URLs. Canon canonicalization, that's the one that you're going to have a problem with. This, I think I, I, I stated this few times in the last lecture. You want to make sure it works correctly if you use the URL as IDs, as you should. I think most crawlers would use the URL, canonical URL as IDs for the documents in the Elasticsearch ID field. Uh, and you want to make sure this stuff works. Somebody mentioned that few URLs actually point to the same page, and I need to make sure that the canonical representation is only one. And also between teammates. 
whatever code you run, you should make sure that your teammates have the same canonical URL so you can tell is this document in the index or not. Some people went as far as computing uh, signatures. Not really signatures, but you know hashing IDs? Uh, if you study hashing in algorithms, you can hash a page, it's called similar hashing, so that if the hash values are relatively close, you can be very confident that that's actually the same document. So there is a similarity hashing algorithm that will hash with the following property. Similar pieces of text will end up with similar hash keys. So then I take the two hash keys and I say, are they within epsilon distance of each other? If they are, I'm going to assume, even though they're not the same, I'm going to assume the documents that were hashed with this signature or key are the same document. But that's not necessary for the homework. I think if you, if you get few, few errors with canonicalization, it's fine, as long as for most of URLs you can tell, is he having the same document as me or not? Here are some ideas for how to do that. Uh, those are all heuristics. There's a lot. What is a URL fragment? In here? Uh, fragment, I think, I think it's, um, what, you mean this? So it lasts with only the fragment. Maybe this, this, uh, yes, sign. Okay. Uh, typically, you, you would pass between slashes. URLs are organized with those between slashes, right? So you say, okay, what's in here? The domain, the first slash, second slash, third slash, so on and so forth. Then you play some of these characters, or send something, you know? Um, that's something that I think you have to put some effort into it. Duplicate detection. Uh, if you have canonical URLs, uh, you will have an easier way to do this. You could implement a similarity hashing or, or, or a signature, and that would be an algorithm for detecting duplicates. But I, I don't think you want to go that far. Or fingerprints, let me see. This is similarity hashing. talked about this. Uh, I didn't mention, but I'm mentioning now, there is a robots.txt and some domains have a sitemap.xml, I think. So there's another file that it, it, it organizes, the, it tells you how the website is organized. Um, the sitemaps, sitemap.txt, .xml is a Google invention. Because Google was the first crawler universally accepted by most of the web in the like early 2000s. They told the websites, if you put a sitemap.xml, it will be a lot easier for the crawler to figure out how to crawl your website for my Google agent. And it will be easier for your server. I don't have to hit it that often. That sitemap can contain also freshness, intervals, and so on and so forth. Uh, before I move on to more crawling, I would like to look at a few things here live. Maybe that's not the... What do we have here? I got two documents from the internet. I download them locally. Today, so that's some, something in the news on CNN. Uh, what I did, I went to the CNN webpage and I say save as page source. So I think some things got saved here and some things did not, like the dynamic content, pulling menus and you know, uh, pictures from other websites maybe didn't get saved. But I looked in here and I could see that there is a body of text related to the article. That is, this is the, uh, it's crazy, right? Let's uh, look at that document. I think I have it here. This is a document that I saved as on my computer. Right. 
try to say VAS, and it's supposed to be this one, Mana for CNN politics. So now what I have, I install a library on my Mac that's called HTML to text. Uh, I did this. You guys know how this works, right? This is what I did. Pip install HTML to text. I think it's Python. That's why it's Pip. But there are many, many libraries. You can clean it up in whatever way you like. I think there is a, what is that thing with a soup? Beautiful. Yeah, so beautiful. I think soup. that's a very popular package people use. That's fine too. Um, so I, I did this one as a try. So how this stuff works, like I could say here, This HTML to text, and I give it an HTML file. Right? You saw that HTML file, how messy it looked like. Here's what this cleaner produces. I mean, I still need to parse this stuff. I have to get this output and kind of make something out of it. Because not everything, I don't want to take the whole thing and send it to Elasticsearch. Just the, it's not clear which one is the body and like. I would like to, if I go back to my document, the main problem of the cleaner is not to strip the HTML tags, right? That's easy to remove. Where is that? I lost it. The main problem of a cleaner is to identify the parts. Hey, look at this document. There's so much junk in here. We would like to extract just the text a separate body, and maybe other things, links, menus, ads, whatever is in there. So getting just the text, this part here, maybe a little problem, I guess. Um, if you tried beautiful soup, and you did, I think, like soup dot get text, would that look better? Or yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. The, the, even this one, I think it has some sections that you can go through it and parse. Um, some of those parsers have built-in APIs for just get text. None of them will work perfectly. So every once in a while, they're going to be tricked. Uh, actually, Safari here comes with a function to do so. Is this this uh, little reader here? If you have a Mac, you know this, that. I, I don't know if other browsers have it on, uh, on Windows or Linux, but this function here is supposed to do that too. You click in here and it shows you a much cleaner version of the document, presumably easier to do. Yeah. So if you're crawling, like you know which domain you're crawling, at least you know how the structure of pages Right, if you crawl no. Wikipedia pages, huh. they're much easier than this. Or, or if it has like has its own sitemap, then you might have a specific site. I don't have the beautiful soup ready to demo, but maybe if if you guys have some questions about this, the TAs will certainly have it done. I think that's the most popular package I've seen, Beautiful Soup. But there are many ways to clean. I think uh, there's a Unix co program that comes built in, uh, format or something in the Macs, uh, that, um, I forgot how it's called, also does some cleaning, but not, not very well. The, the problem with these documents, they are way too complicated to clean them perfectly. So let's look at a different one. Let's look at the Wikipedia document I have here. The Wikipedia document, right? I also saved it on my computer. This is Napoleon, Wikipedia. I can do the same. Call this on the Napoleon. I get some output that I may have to parse. Where is the text? This 
still coming from this page. I mean, Napoleon is not a particularly easy Wikipedia page. There's a lot of stuff about him. So uh, what, what, what my point is here, when you try a cleaner like this, HTML to text or beautiful soup or links or whichever, you have to do exactly this. Look at the page on a browser and look at the output of that cleaner to kind of make sense of what do I need. You're going to need at least the text and the links. Those cleaners produce more information here. Maybe paragraphs, segmentations, source, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to worry about all that. Do I really don't have the text here? I think there's a text in the All this stuff. Huh? All this stuff. I think this is some sort of listing of all that. I think this is kind of the text that's in the web page. Yes. Uh, if you say uh, table is hard to like. Uh, Table is hard to describe them. Should we include table text in our assignment? Or should we just like uh, skip it? I don't answer the question if you say what? Oh, uh, you said like there is a problem with a uh, table, right? With what? Table. Table. Tables. So should we include that in our assignment? Because uh, if we include it, like I'm thinking whether it's like uh, will affect our result. Or the minimum requirement is what I expect you to do is to not do something special for tables. I expect you to re be able to read the output of the cleaner, to know what is text, and what's a link, and what's a menu, and to take from there everything that looks like text. Now, that may include a table that has been destroyed. It's only the values in the table, but there's no information about rows and columns. It may include headers. It may include dates. Uh, you know Wikipedia has a table on the right side? That would be a project, an interesting project, just for Wikipedia. Can you recover this table information separately? So we have a sense, here's the body of the page, and here is the indexed information, the table. This has to be more like key value pairs. It doesn't make sense to, to destroy this table, make it a paragraph, right? If, if I make out of this table a paragraph, how, how would this look as a paragraph? It wouldn't make any sense, right? But if I keep it as key value pairs, coronation, date, predecessor, this, successor, Victor Manuel, in office, date, that, date. This is, the, the, the basic notion here is a key value pair, right? If I can process this as a key value pair automatically from the cleaner, I mean, I'm assuming this is somewhere in the cleaner output, and store it in my Elasticsearch fields, not in the text field, but separately, that would be very good for retrieval, right? If somebody asks a question, I can directly answer it from this table as opposed to from the text. But for these tables, I would do a key value pair and I would have to store it separately. What your question is, what happens if there's a table right here? Typically, table gets destroyed and you're gonna see these words as text and you're gonna include them as text. Uh, you don't have to include them, but figure out where the table is to skip it. It's actually a wrinkle. It's easier to just say, okay, what's that? Needless to say, this is a much easier document than the CNN one. It's far less junk in here. So one of the, again, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but one of the problems you're going to have here is not to write your own cleaner. That's extremely hard to choose one and to understand how output relates to what you see in the page. So what are the parts that I'm going to get and where do, you know, how do I process those? Most of them just get stuff online and just get stuff. Right, I, I think the beautiful soup may have APIs to give you directly what organizes in sections. 
Yeah, but that you need to know, like, if you are only doing Wikipedia page and you know these are the sections that you can do with any library. But if you're just saying, okay, this is the HTML page and get me text. And then no, I think they do retrieve text versus links versus other things. Um, you have to check the documentation. So I have another example here. Uh, actually, I want to show you the options I can put here. When I, when I get an output, I could say things like ignore links or protect links or things like that and ignore other things. So there may be some ways that are beneficiary for, for you guys to say, you know, ignore tables, for example. Would that work 100%? No. But you can choose some of these options, uh, you know, maybe ignore images or other things that will, will make your job easier. Again, your, your, your purpose here is just to get the text and the links out. You may have to do some with, um, with these options. This is a simpler program than Beautiful Soup. Beautiful Soup will, will have more options, but I think it, it may also take more time to, to learn it. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you here. And then, more slides. Um, so we keep talking about coverage because coverage is an issue related to the homework. How you organize that list of URLs impacts what you're going to get. For you, the problem is the focus, the relevance. But in general, suppose I write the general problem. What should I worry about? So I don't have a focus tool. I'm not, I'm not just doing World War II. I crawl in general pages. Why, why, why would I worry about coverage? So I should, should I give some domains a priority, first of all? It's one thing. Should I worry about the size of the domain? Like, you know, there's domains that are very small, they have few pages, and domains that are very big, they have a lot of pages. Should I worry about what's called spider traps? Things that seem to be linked all to each other with no exit, but this doesn't appear to be new information. You just go through these pages, it's all the same junk, but it's not nothing new. How do I get out of those? Yes. Uh, can you just do it by tracking your previous links and saying if you've already visited it, don't do it again? Uh, yes, sure, but some spider traps are really big. Okay. They, uh, just keeping track of the links. You probably want to keep track of the prefix of the URL, uh, not just the link. The yeah. prefix to say, if I seem to be in there, the same prefix for a long time, maybe put a max, maximum from this example.com slash Virgil, the maximum I can get is 10,000 links. After that, I jump out of it. Uh, could you do like a depth or something? Right, right. Mo most crawlers have a depth parameter that will say from the seed, how far out do you want to go? BFS works naturally by depth, right? You go wave one, then wave two, then wave three. And when you're done, you process by depth. You didn't go too far out into one branch and too little now. But when you start playing, reordering the URLs in the fifth of you, it's not by depth anymore, right? It's possible now that you make more depth progress into one branch and less depth into another. You can probably have still a limit. Even if I reorder the URLs, how deep am I willing to go into any branch? No deeper than five, let's say, or six, even with the reordering. So you have a hard stop. But that, that doesn't mean spider traps, right? At depth six, I could have enormous numbers of pages in, in a spider trap. I'm not saying those issues are hard to deal with. I'm saying you have to be aware. Uh, so this is uh, some general ideas for how to do frontier management. How do you prioritize some things? Um, usually, breadth first search is the basic algorithm. And then there's all kinds of heuristics that you can implement for a certain purpose. Your purpose, again, remember, is to get good documents. 
for that topic. Let me see what else. I don't want to go through all these slides. There's a lot of academic research into what works better than other things. So, um, you know, here's uh, six algorithms for prioritizing crawling, right? BFS, it's one of them, like just FIFO, uh, in, by page rank, by backlink count, on and on and on, and how those things progress in terms of, uh, and this is measured by page rank. The higher it gets, I got high page rank pages. Many, many papers in information retrieval conferences and, and uh, uh, knowledge management conferences about how to crawl um, not just the web. Uh, sometimes companies have big archives of their own documents that need to be crawled. Uh, they don't have links, but they have an organization, some sort of catalog. Similarly with what you see in the libraries with like organization per topics and then with each topic and then how much do you go by to get access uh, if you're a newspaper, if you look at an archive or something. How do you go by, you can't read everything so you have to pick a pull first. That's very similar to a crawler. See the URLs, you have that from me, you don't have to worry about where to get them. Uh, freshness, we talk about this, head request. There is a, uh, you, know, you know, I think this is an academic failure in here. It's one of these examples where somebody got an idea and to make a career out of it, they keep beating that idea. <laughs> but it's not that much to it. There's, you'd be amazed how much work there is into page age cost versus benefits approaches. That uh, freshness has to do with how often do I crawl certain pages. Like I said, you don't want to have the same interval on all pages. Some things you need to grow much faster than others. You want to balance the load both on your servers and the ones you hit with your crawl in a way that page that really need updated quickly, there's an earthquake somewhere and there's information about that working that needs to be quick versus things that are pretty static, Napoleon page, doesn't have to be updated. It's not going to change at all. So there's people who went as far as creating a theory with integrals about all this, how the age of a page and what's the cost related to if you don't crawl, how many hits, if you are a search engine, how many user queries you're not going to be able to answer correctly because you have not updated your index. And that can be transformed into ads money to tell you how much you lost by not updating this page. I think this is exaggerated as far as I know, but I'm not working for Google ad program, so may, maybe they, they have some metrics there. But there's uh, more than necessary about this. Pages versus coverage. Uh, here's a list of a bunch of ideas for crawling priority and depending on the objectives, which one seems to work. So we say bread for search. What's bread for search good for? It's good for moving as close as possible to your seats, right? You have the seats, you've got layer one, wave one, and then wave two. If you come with wave two, you know anything that you don't have, it's not within two waves of the seats, right? So it does the coverage, uh, but it, BFS have no sense of the importance of the page as measured by page rank. Page rank measures the importance in a graph sense, right? How, how, how many things point to this page? So you can modify the, the, you will not modify the complete order, you start with the BFS FIFO queue, and then you can, every once in a while, resort the queue to some degree based on different criteria. Um, uh, I don't both, just to give you a sense. Um, of how how complicated things can be. I'm going to show you a paper 
I think it's from 2008, yeah, seven or eight, 2007 maybe. And keep in mind that this is not a Google or Bing document. As I said, academic papers are somewhat in between a class project and industry. So if you think this is complicated, the Google crawler is a lot more complicated than this. So you'll see in here what I mean by when I say things can get complicated really quick. Uh, they have all kinds of theorems, like mathematical theorems, about missing rates. Um, so if, if you, if you want to go into uh, how crawlers work and what are the conditions and the concerns real, real systems have about crawling, you can't jump from this class directly to work for Google. The, the gap is too much. You have to go through this intermediary step of say, okay, what was academia looking a few years ago? This is a paper with enough citations and we have a slide about it in the class, right? So what are the concerns here? Politeness, they have some, some approach to politeness in terms of how to hit what servers to what rates, for example. They have some theoretical guarantees about if you do what we do, that typically appears in theoretical papers. There is a guarantee that I'm not gonna miss more than some percent of the data that I need or something like that. Uh, they have crawling operations describing time and efficiency. So for example, uh, I think there's somewhere in here. Here. This paragraph. So I think they run, let it run it uh, three months. Right? This is 2007, so that's 11 years ago. And how many pages we got? Six billion? Is that right? Six billion? And how many links we processed? 400 billion links? These are people working in a university, so they will also describe in here the difficulty they had with running a crawler through university servers. Because when you, you crawl six billion pages, things are not easy to set up. Of course, this is different for Google or Bing, they're a commercial company, they have farms of computer. Um, and again, this is 2007. And it's academia, this is not the actual reality of 2007. So you have to think, okay, if I want to work on this domain crawling infrastructure indexing for a big company, from this IR class that we're just teaching, all the way to the industry, there's at least two big steps that you have to go through. There will be a project, uh, we, we don't have time for projects at double speed, but in, in other, I mean, I, I do it with you if you want. We, if students are interested in a particular thing, like say a crawler, what we do, we, it's not for the grade. We take a paper like this, and you try to get your project from Homework 3, your crawler, to make it a much more fancy crawler by implementing some of these ideas. So that can constitute a, a class project, which we don't have as a required, but some students choose to do every once in a while a class project. This crawler could be a project, a machine learning application to data could be another project. Uh, I don't know if there's another thing that I've seen here that uh, didn't catch my attention. Oh yeah, they talk a lot about scalability and disk in input and output, which again relates to the fact that they have certain hardware, so how hard can it hit those hard disks and how often? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a break now. I don't think there's anything else that you need here. I talk about a little bit spider traps. The obvious example of spider traps is a calendar. In a calendar, you can always click on next, and it goes next forever. It never stops. But most of the spider traps are actually adversarial spider traps, where it's designed to keep you in that, in that uh, link file. Uh, some ideas for how to avoid it. Um, I would say the best idea is to count. C 
count how many pages I have from a domain or for a domain prefix, and when I hit the hard limit, just say no more pages from here. That is the safest thing to do. Encoding is we're not going to go there. You, you don't have to worry about any of this because you don't do low level encoding. You will just get a plain text, send it to Elasticsearch. I think that's it. Uh, one more thing before the break. Your homework tree asks you for a visual on top of Elasticsearch. So you have Elasticsearch running, but you need to have a visual, some sort of web interface where you can type a query and get to see a bunch of results. Typically easy with a little bit of JavaScript. Uh, we have few links for this. Anybody clicked on those? Kalaka and stuff like that. So you can set up one of these. We also have some dead links. People mention Trekival, but also some of these interfaces that are written by the grad student also there. I have to check what's up with those. I think the university is moving from ccs.nu.edu to ccis.northeastern.edu, and some links get uh, redirected, uh, and they are not found. The problem you guys had with Trekival, I know. Uh, before, I'm actually curious if any one of you knows why that is. So let me describe the problem for everybody. I'm here at the, the, the website. I click on Homework 3. Uh, you see the link is ccs.nu.edu. And then, uh, sorry, I'm in Homework 1. So Homework 1. This doesn't get redirected to CCIS the Northeastern. But if I click on Trekival link, if you look at the bottom here, this is still a ccs.nu.edu link. But if I click on it, it gets redirected to a, to a different server, ccis.northeastern.edu. So I think they are in the process of migration or something, because this never been a problem before. And I tried to fix it. I don't know how to fix it right now. It may be because the extension of the file, the track is a PL or a zip file, maybe some links get redirected. I'll try to fix the website. But I think Trekival has been posted on Piazza. And uh, this data, and we may have to post it separately. In here, the, the vertical search I'm talking about is one of these links. You can choose any visual you want. Kalaka and Facet View are things that you can adapt. I think it's GitHub links. This is written by one of our grad students, but again, has the same problem. It gets redirected to a new domain, and it doesn't work. So I'll try to fix this by tomorrow. Let's take a break, and then we'll talk a little bit about the web graph. timing so far. Is it overwhelming? This this assignment is uh, because I started with the understanding that framework. Which one? crappy framework that is usually the Oh I, I wouldn't do that. I, I mean it's up to you. Are you using scrappy framework? Beautiful soup. Mm, I'm using beautiful soup but okay. only the get text function. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But well, how about the links? The links I used on um, my s a function from Scrappy source code and they called uh, cannot nullize um, URL. Okay. Yeah. I didn't use Scrappy like as a frame. So something I didn't show about app here. Here's the Wikipedia page of Napoleon. I can put a head request. I get the head. Yeah. It and is I, the most. I can put a get request 
You don't have to go to curl. You can do it from Python. And that's the whole page. No. I, I did uh, scrap it because I thought it would be useful in the long run. Oh, yeah, probably. But the, uh, the learning curve was a little high, so I got hold of it on the yesterday evening, understanding that we had to do a course and all. But I am still, I still have two or three more things to do with, uh, if I get that, the full solution. So a lot of benefits on those data classes, uh, data mining, IR, even machine learning to some degree. There is a class on AI, there is a class on parallel processing. It's not the conceptual stuff. It's your ability to work with those two. It's Elasticsearch, Hadoop, um, machine learning libraries, indexing, text cleaning, NLTK, uh, you know, NLP tools. Sooner or later, if you get in the industry, you're going to need to use some of these tools. Right? So I think the biggest benefit in those classes is not so much the conceptual part, but rather, can you hands-on do this? How do you do it? What package do I use to get? clean, to index, how do I keep track of. Uh, there's a lot of st stuff that's, um, I, I'm not sure if, if beautiful soup or, or, or this one. For example, dates. Can we identify dates as dates and not have them as plain text? Dates are useless as a string of characters. You need to have dates as some numerical format that you can no, it's a number in seconds or minutes or minutes and then relate to that number, right? Uh, typical NLP problems, another big problem that there is right now, um, abbreviations. If you don't have a dictionary for abbreviations, it's really hard to parse. Because people write stuff in, a, in with abbreviations that they think it's obvious what the abbreviation is, but it's not. So I, I think ability to process uh, all data like that and, and do stuff with it is what's going to be left for you guys to say, okay, when I go out and I get a job, how, how useful this class is going to be. So this one was like, to at least get all the documents was pretty straightforward for me, but the homework too I thought was like, like extra hard. Extra hard to create the index yeah. and do the merging? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. How but you fell off if you take two classes. Say last term you took two classes. Mm -hmm. Does it feel more work than those two classes together? Mm -hmm. Not close. Easier. Yeah. Okay. So the, the the point is one class at double speed should be about the same work as two classes. Only for two months that you feel like that. So I think you're saying it's easier. I mean, you you don't have contact switches. Yeah. yeah. I thought. <laughs> but how long did it take to? Exactly. Uh, I don't know. I just ran it overnight on the, on the server. Okay. That's fine. Um, I, I didn't use any frameworks. I just wrote a script and then. Use the some get function to get the text and process yeah. it. Uh, I use beautiful soup to get the text out. That's fine. Yeah. And beautiful soup. I think is a is a default option in Python. So if if. Uh, is an updated, I mean, beautiful soup is easier to use, but I think it's the performance wise, it's considered to be slow, so they have something called as LX and then, so I that's know. like an updated. Uh, is beautiful soup written in Python? Um, yes. Yeah, so everything that's Python, it's going to be impossible to put in a production line. Just so you know, when you have anything done in Python, and you go to a production, typically in a company, even a small company, there is a research testing group and there is a production group which makes sure systems are running properly. When you, I work a lot with research groups consulting. I, I don't work in production groups, but many companies come and say, we need some help with algorithms, with machine learning, should we try this or that? That's typically the research groups that they, they, they're not really research, they just try out ideas before putting into production, right? So I, I work now with a company, a few people that do a lot of medical stuff, and everything I do for them, they rewrite in Java. Nothing of what I do can ever, they, they say you have no hope of your code ever running, because unless it's a backend thing overnight, because anything that we do, 
uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's piloting. It's easy Python, Perl, all those scripts, but not not fast enough. So you can um, some of those things are a little hard because the library that you're using, say Beautiful Soup, right? It's very fancy and complicated, and it's not an equivalent of it in Java. I, I don't know if that's the case. I'm just JS or something. Yeah. Sometimes those things are hard to translate if there's no translation available. So I, I've run into this issue when the production group says that works your, your code, your, your, your analysis, but we don't know how to take that and make it into Java or C. So we can't really use that unless we have, we have to go a different route. Because in a production, it's only Java or C or C sharp. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you again the head request right here. So I think that to get the robots.txt file, that's not through a head request. I think I've said that wrongly last time. Uh, I think the robots.txt is just domain slash robots.txt, so you have to parse that. Uh, I use the URL dev, like there's like a built in robots.txt parser. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, just use that. Yeah. Um, I think I have a robots.txt file. Just take Wikipedia slash. Yeah. Robots with TXT. Tells you what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, the problem with robots with TXT, did, did you ever look into those files? Uh, with yeah. human eyes? Mm -hmm. You see these comments? <laughs> yeah. Like they know this agent when they ignore the robots with TXT file anyway. Right? <laughs> Because it's you can do that you can build it. Uh, there's no 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 formal requirement constraint to have to follow the robots of the file. All right. Uh, so let me let me talk a, a little bit about the, the the web graph. That's what we're gonna do next. Toyish web graph just to discuss things conceptually first. I have it here. So I have uh, six nodes, nodes who correspond to web pages, of course, and I have links between them. Of course, this is an example toyish graph. Uh, we are familiar with the general concepts of graphs. I, I mentioned this before. I don't insist. Nodes and edges and directed edges that uh, are not going both ways. I'm just going in the direction of the edge. I can count things like in degrees and out degree. What's the out degree of B? Four, because it's four outgoing things. What's the in degree of B? Two. Right? Uh, I can have pages to themselves, maybe, 
sometimes, not, not in this case, but in some graphs I can have some links to the, the same notes. Uh, so the problem of understanding this web graph, the first problem we're going to study is page rank. Uh, but before we do so, we need a little bit of theory, not the page rank theory, just the general how do we think of moving in a graph? So we already talked about traversals, BFS and DFS. That I have a graph, I want to go from a point to either another point or to reach everywhere possible. How do I start moving from a point, the, the starting node, in a graph? So I do BFS way by way or DFS uh, deep first, right? In here, I want to talk about a different walking or traversing the graph. We're going to call it walk, not traversal. Traversal is going to stay with BFS, DFS. So we can write here BFS, DFS. Those are traversal algorithms. And here we're going to be concerned with random walks. Now, that's a convention. You can say BFS does a walk in a graph, if you want. What we are concerned here with are statistical properties. Effectively, imagine that these are malls or restaurants. And it, these are all the restaurants in Boston. Right? And I have a lot of individuals at a current time T. So I'm at T0, that's today. Today. Everybody eats at the restaurant, right? How many uh, total votes I have here? That's Boston population, right? Today, I'm assuming people don't cook at home in here, right? So I'm saying everybody ate somewhere, correct? So these are my Boston restaurants, and these are the people, and this guy went to this restaurant. That's today. Uh, let's say not today, let's say um, January 1st. Everyone, every person, person is a dot, eats at a certain restaurant. A restaurant is a node in this graph. So I'm going to ask, what's going to happen tomorrow? That's January 2nd, next day. Everybody's going to eat again at the restaurant, right? But not at the same restaurant necessarily they eat today. So a person from here, we, we're going to say the way the, those, those people move to another restaurant to eat, they follow these edges. If you eat here today, in restaurant E, where can you eat tomorrow? In A. If you eat in B, where can you eat tomorrow? This is one of these outgoing edges, right? This phenomena happens in a lot of places. I'm using this example of people in restaurants. Uh, you can see these examples in, say, uh, page rank, uh, not page rank, web, web uh, navigation. Most people who are on this page right now, what they, where they're going to go next? Very likely they're going to click on one of the outgoing links and they're going to follow one of these documents. Of course, they can choose to do other things, shut down their computer, for example. But if they choose to keep going in a the graph, they're going to follow one of these links. What are other examples that you can think of a problem can be modeled that way? Once I'm in here, there are four ways to go. And at the next step, whatever step is, a day or next campaign or next click or, you know, a step corresponds to a natural event. At the next step from this state, I'm very likely to go into one of those forces that are outgoing links from this point, state, stage, page, something, restaurant. What other type of navigation or example can we frame this way? 
Air travel. Air travel. Air travel. Right? Um, although air travel, I think it's a little bit different organized today. There's these hubs, right? Like if you fly Delta, you go through, I don't know where, Cincinnati or Atlanta, and from there you can go to everywhere. So I think that's not the best example, but it is true that from certain places you can go there, 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 and from another hub you can go to other airports. What fits in this framework? What else? Don't have to be things that are physical in, 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 you know, it doesn't have to necessarily mean people moving around. How about taking courses in CCIS? Remember your complaint last time? You take courses. Is it the case that once I take a certain course, most students from that course, next course will take some courses? I don't mean all the students, I'm just going to say, once you take that course, most students will follow some path, right? And there's few paths that are well popular and very few people get unusual paths, right? What else? Hierarchy promotions, right? when you get a career, the way you get promoted, very likely, once you have some achievement from there, you, you move in a certain direction in your career, right? What else? Military strategies, I think, works like this. Once you are in a certain position or situation, you're very likely to do one of the four things that are, are typical for that situation. Games. Most games are programmed that way, including chess. Once I'm in a certain state, of course, chess has a lot more states than six, hundreds of thousands, not millions or billions. But once I'm in a certain state, I evaluate my options and I'm likely to choose one of those four options that will put me into one of those states. A lot of games, the way AI is implemented, even in games like StarCraft, it's implemented like this. The game can only be in one of the following possibilities. That's not covering all possibilities, but it covers the most typical ones. Once the game decides this is one of those situations, it chooses out of likelihood branches that are likely to win the game. That, that theory is called reinforcement learning. It learns what, what of these are more beneficial once I'm in here, which way to go. Uh, so a lot of games, you notice sometimes the game gets stuck and players can take advantage because they know the game is gonna get stuck. That's one of the situations that's not implemented. It's, it can only go to one of those four states, but none of them is good. So the players know, you know, AI in that position will end up just being back and forth and not doing anything. What other situations were like this? Or, or, or? Conflict recommendations. Is it true that once you see a certain movie, people move to see other movies? I'm not sure that's true. I mean, just a recommendation. Yeah, but I think it's more reciprocal. This, this, the difference between these recommendations is that in recommendations, when you see one of those movies or two, you get much more likely to see another one that's in that group. But in here, it's unidirectional. It's not from F to B or from D to B. It doesn't work the same way. You have to imagine this as a, a path that gets followed typically in a certain way. Um, maybe a social network. Social network, I also think, is more reciprocal than, than this. It depends on your state space. If states each, can be anything you want. Yeah, if each of your states represents a complete watching history for Netflix, uh, for example, that will be the next like um, watching history. So each uh, node, uh, so each pass represents the movie that you watch next. I think that works really well for recommendation if you say, based on this watching history, this is the next item or items you're gonna watch, not the next watching history. I don't, I don't think that works very well to say, I'm gonna predict the whole watching history, but what, what recommendations do, given a history and some other information, what are the next two or three items? Items is not, if you make the node a history, node cannot also be an item. 
Yeah, so therefore you go to another watching history, which is one movie more than the previous movie. I think that that not a, not a lot of users would follow exactly the same watching history from there. So I think it's easy to predict one or two items, hard to predict the next 20 things you're going to see in one order. Yeah, that's not going to predict. But there are many situations that have this kind of um, they have this kind of uh, flavor. Once you are here, think about the game of chess. How many people know how to play chess? Chess? Okay. Once you get to a certain state, it doesn't matter how you got there. Because you're there. That's how it is. It, it, whatever, how pieces get to that position, it's irrelevant. What matters is the current position. So this is called memoryless. states. The state matters, but not how we got here. See, what I mean to say in a web graph, if I apply this to the pages, once the user is here, I'm going to make the following assumption. It doesn't matter how he got here. It just matters that from here, he's going to go to one of those four states where the links come back. With high probability. So there is a mathematic model for how all this stuff works that applies to chess, to games, to random marks, to military strategy, to bidding actions, uh, to traveling, you know, rerouting packages, you know, it's called the Markov chain processes, right? Uh, and it's typically for memoryless states, Markov chain. Page rank is just another uh, applications of Markov chains. The theory. The theory is not the same as the practice, but the theory of page rank is just a Markov chain process that says, imagine I have those two million users within six pages. Same as saying Boston population, 2.5 million people going to restaurants. And every day, they move to a next restaurant. According to the others, if I'm in D, I can move to C, to A, to E, and F. If I'm in B, I can move to F, and E, and uh, D, and C, so on and so forth. So there's a transition matrix for the memoryless processes. There's a transition matrix. It's called a probability transition matrix which is fixed, so it doesn't change. So the probability, I'm going to say here, to move from, uh, say, A to B, and there is a probability for moving from A to uh, C, and there is a probability for moving from A to, where else can I move from A? F? F? And those probabilities should sum to 1, because once I'm in A, I have to move somewhere. If A would have a link to itself, there will be a probability to move from A to A, aka to stay in A, to eat at the same restaurant. So in a lot of Markov processes, like for a game, if I implement a game, I need to figure out those probabilities. That's what reinforcement learning does a lot of times. That's trial and error by playing chess with itself a billion times and figures out if you are in this state, it's better to move to C, not to B. While, while legally you can, in the game of chess, you can move to both B and C, you can have two different actions, it's better to do that. How they figure that out, they play a lot of chess games with all kinds of exploration strategies. Try something that you haven't tried before, just to see how likely it's to succeed. Um, so I've looked at Markov chains in a little while, but I'm wondering if the sparseness of the matrix creates some issues? So you're going to have a lot of zeros? Uh, yes, it does. But, but this is a theoretical argument, so we just describing page rank as a concept first, and then we'll see, okay, how do we actually implement it. Right. But, but, but uh, one thing that K 
can address the sparsity, I'm not sure, is in here we don't have those properties learned. We're not gonna run random walk the web graph. I mean, you can look at people's histories because Google knows where you've been and where you're going, for example. But, but suppose we don't have that. So suppose we, um, we, we don't know where people tend to go from A. If there are few links, these are web pages now with links, we're gonna assume uniform probability of moving around. So what would those be? In this case, for A, if it's uniform, it's got to be one-fourth, right? Because there are four links, so I have to go down from A to A. What would happen for uh, E, probability for moving from E to A? One. one. How about from C? C to B. So I, I, we can write this in a we can write this in a in a real matrix, right? We can have a matrix that's like A, B, C, D, E, F, right? And we can have here. A, B, C, D, F, and I'm not going to write the whole matrix, but I can take C and say, what's the probability for C? It can move to E with probability one half, and where else? D, probability one half, and everything is not written, that's zero. So I'll just write another one for A here. If I'm including the back loop, I have one fourth. One fourth. One fourth and F, you say? Yeah. So I can write this transition probability matrix. Again, that's fixed. In Markov chains, this does not change. Maybe it's unknown, maybe you have to discover it, maybe you have to learn it or do something about it, but it's not changing. So that's how we want to think of random walks in a graph. If I'm in a node, I follow one of the links at random. That's why we have this uniform probabilities over here. And I really want you to think of e millions of these agents. This is my web graph, but I have millions of users, right? Just the same people with the restaurants. I have users on the web. And at next time, so I have um, distribution of agents in the graph at time t0, I'm going to call that pi0. I'm going to say how many agents I have in each state when I start. That's a prior, right? Like, typically, when you do this for restaurants, you can have a sense of how popular the restaurants are, how expensive they are. If you do it for the graph, for the web graph, you can say, I'm going to assume CNN has more visitors than a random website, right? If I do it for, for chess, there's some positions that occur more often than others, right? Some situations. Or I could say, I don't know, what can I do here if I don't know how to start? I don't know. Starting means, where do I place the agents in the beginning? Doesn't matter. Hmm? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, but I have to start somewhere. So I'm going to start uniform. I don't have to start uniform, but I could start uniform if I have no other information of where the agents might go. You're right, it doesn't matter. If I run enough iterations of agents moving around, I'm going to end up with a fixed distribution. But it's better if I run a simulation to start with a uniform distribution. So what's going to happen at, at time pi 1? So that's uh, time t1. I have pi 1. 
every agent moved. If somebody was in, in A, it moved to either B or C or F or back to A. Right? If somebody was in E, 100% sure, and next time is in A. If somebody was in D, it's now time next round, it's in E or F or A or C. So what I would like to know is what is pi 1 for A? If I started with this distribution of agents, so I have 2 million agents, 1 sixth of them in A, 1 sixth of them in B, 1 sixth in C, 1 sixth in D, 1 sixth in E, 1 sixth in F. How many of those agents are going to be in A once everyone moves? They move probabilistically, I can't tell for sure. An agent from B might be now in C, or in D, or in E, right? But I know that they move with that probability. So if I have 300,000 agents in B, I can say that many of them are now in A, that many of them go to C, that many go, go to D. So the question is, how do I compute those values for the next round by one from the previous round D equals zero or pi zero. It's a memoryless process, so it's only the previous state that matters. Everything beyond previous state is irrelevant because that's not how I got to that state. So who is pi one of A? I want to count the agents that are in A, that they moved from anywhere to A during the transition phase between the times. How can I do that? Well, where agents can come from to reach A? Mm -hmm. hmm? From where? Indians. Yeah, yeah, but which one of those nodes can have agents moving to A? D. Mm -hmm. D. 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 So, out of all the agents that were in D, how many of them moved to A? Is Pi zero of D is all agents that were in D, right? Mm -hmm. Previous round. But not all of them moved to A. How many of them moved to A? One sixth. Probably two. Not one sixth. Probability of, Probability of moving from D, D to, to A. A. So this is how many of them were in previous round in D. As a proportion, I can multiply every single three million to get a count if I want. And this is out of how many were in D, how many moved to A. Who else? Were the people that were in A and stayed in A, right? Uh, is there any chance that I count anything twice here? Is there any agent that's counted twice? No. Why not? Because if they were in D, they couldn't have been in A. This is a deterministic. The chance of moving is probabilistic. But where an agent's been the previous round, that's deterministic. If it was in D, it was not in A. So I'm not counting the same. The same agent cannot be at pi zero time both in D and in A. Who else could have moved to A? The ones from E? times the probability, this probability is 100%, right? So everybody from me, this would be 100%, everybody from me is now in A. Who else could have moved in A? D. F. Is that it from, where can I get to A from? I can get from F from D, from E, and from A, is that right? Yeah. Right. So that is this value here. Who is now in A? I can do the same for B, right? I can look what agents can come to B. If I do that, pi one of B will be, who can come to B? 
how many incoming arrows I have to be. Yeah, two. two incoming, right? So it's the previous in A times the probability of moving from A to B plus the previous from F times the probability of moving F to B. That would be this value here. And in fact, one and zero here is just the next round. The same exact computation will happen after round 10 to round 11, after round 13 to round 14. So this is really t plus 1 with respect to round t. Right? It's saying everything at the previous round was in that state or node or page, whatever I'm modeling, times the probability of moving to a. And I'm summing them up by inclusion exclusion principle. I'm not counting anything twice because those are disjoint sets. Agents from F are different than the agents from D, different than the agents of A. And am I counting everything at least once? Because in, when you count, you have to make sure you don't count anything twice, but you also have to make sure you count everything. Am I missing a possibility? In other words, I have to make sure I account for everybody who might come to A. So I have to make sure I go through all the nodes that have a link to A, because if I skip some, this means I'm not counting those people coming from B. In this, I don't need a B, because the probability of moving from B to A is zero. Okay? So that's how I can transform this, and I can write this in an actual algebraic form. If you look at what this is as a vector, so vector, P, pi uh, t plus 1 as a vector is who? Is really pi t times the whole probability matrix. Let's call it M. This whole here is a matrix M. It's called transition matrix. So it's really M or M transpose. You, you have to figure out the exact way to make it multiply. But it's really, vectorially speaking, the previous vector of probabilities or, or, or distribution. This, this sums to 1, right? Because it's a, what proportion of agent is in each count. Multiplied by the transition matrix will give me the next distribution of agent. There is a theorem related to Markov chain and these processes that says what, what he was saying. In most cases, unless you have really weird stuff, wherever you start putting those agents in, and you tell them, go ahead, buddy, for a million rounds and eat at different restaurants, or click through pages, or move in a game, whatever, they're going to end up in a stationary distribution. A stationary distribution. Guess what property it has? Are we going to call it pi star? Let's put the star down. Pi star. It's a distribution that if I move the agents from that distribution, I multiply with them to move them to the next round, what? Says There's no change. So it's a distribution that says equilibrium distribution. People that eat today in those restaurants, if you look at the restaurants, right? We literally go today in Boston and count what proportion of people eat in every restaurant. What do you think is going to happen tomorrow? Very likely, those distributions will be extremely, extremely similar. Means the eating habits in terms of distributing people to restaurants, it reaches an equilibrium and not going to change that much. And that happens. After, you know, everyone's the, the, there's a big event like the downtown gets in construction mode or some big chains of restaurants get bankrupt, then the distribution starts to change. But it reaches equilibrium, right? Can you imagine a, a sort of graph where I, I said some weird situations where we don't have equilibrium? I said most of the time, unless you have non ergosity properties, you're going to reach equilibrium. But there's some state, some sort of graphs, very particular, that you don't reach equilibrium. 
Imagine this kind of graph. This is a periodic graph. The name doesn't matter. It has a weird property that everybody, every agent here at state T, I know exactly after a number of states in the future. Say, if an agent is here at time T, I know at T plus, you know, I know exactly after 1785 rounds, exactly where this agent is going to be. Right? Because this is a graph that forces agents on a unique path. It's not random at all. Right? There's no randomness involved here. If those would be three restaurants, everybody who eats here, next day will have to eat here, the day after here, and so on and so forth. Graphs that have this property do not reach a stationary distribution. Um, this is more of a question about that graph. Let's say you have some like physical characteristics, like geographic location. And so could you weight the edges um, in terms of like how far away something is, maybe by the coordinates or something, and then have that factor into the probabilities? Yes. So that's what people do. Markov chains do not do that for you. You have to provide the transition matrix. So people model the transition matrix by different factors. Proximity, cost, popularity, attraction, likelihood, whatever, whatever, whatever. In the end, though, Markov chain only can take one probability per cell. So they do not work when you need to model with more than one probability. You might say, in this case, the transition is that. But according to other factors, like the previous, previous state or some other characteristics, in a different situation, this cell is now 140, is 150. Then the Markov chains don't work. You need to provide a fixed probability transition matrix. But yes, that's what happens in practice. Even people wait for buses. There is an application of Markov chain or how likely your bus is going to come and things like that based on uh, memoryless processes. Uh, you'd be amazed how far you can get with these simple models. How many people are going to buy how much meat on Memorial Day or Labor Day coming up for barbecues? Very accurate prediction based on these things. Okay. Um, how people are going to react to how, how much traffic on the highway is going to be determined by weather. Like if it rains, how much more, you know, for some reason, cars slow down when it rains, right? You notice that? It's more traffic. So if it rains, how much by the inch, how much the traffic is going to slow down? Very accurate predictions. Especially in a place where I can measure traffic and weather easily. Um, I think it's been applied to global uh, like sea level changes and other things. This, if, you're, if you live in data science, sooner or later you're going to have to hit Markov chains and understand how they work. They're unavoidable. But back to our problem. We are in a web graph. We do not have a given probability matrix unless we want to learn it or, or, or prior, create a prior. We just assume random probabilities. Uh, just one more thing on, on uh, Markov chains before I talk about page rank. Suppose all things work like described here. I have a fixed transition matrix. I start with some distributions. I don't have this kind of periodic graphs to get stuck. I know I'm going to reach a stationary distribution. How can I compute this pi star? Solve for it. I can solve this equation, right? That's what you're saying. Or I can simulate it. Describe exactly this T0, T1, right? I could start with a uniform distribution. Literally do this multiplication here. Pi 1 is pi 0 times n. Then what? Pi 2 is pi 1 times n. Then pi 3 is pi 2 times n. And when do I stop? And how many rounds I go? Until, until, delta is small. until pi t plus 1 is close enough to pi t, I need to find a proper measure to understand what close enough means. But assuming I do that, I can stop when I say it looks stationary to me, it doesn't change. Good. So I have at least two ways of computing this pi star. One is by forcing it brute force. 
Another one is by solving this equation. By the way, by brute force, I may be able to do faster. You guys know this squaring fast multiplication by squaring sort of algorithms? Instead of multiplying one by one. So it, it, what, what is this really saying? Pi at the power pi 100. Who is pi 100? It's really the initial pi 0 multiplied with m 100 times, right? Because it's pi 1 is times m, pi 2 is times m times m, pi 3 is m times m times m. So it's really pi 0 multiplied with m at the power 100. Can I raise m at the power 100 faster than multiplying with m with itself 100 times? How? Mm, I break m to 100 down to m to the 50 and break that down to m to 25. Square it, and square, square, it, square it, square it. Yeah. But the right way to break it is not 50 and 25. What's the right way to break this 100? You, you took my algorithms class, and that's how I started, right? Well, that's the idea. You want to multiply two, two, 2 by 2, get m to the fourth, m to the fourth times m to the fourth, get m to the eighth, right? So the right way to break this is the powers of 2. 100 in particular would be 64 32. plus 32 plus 4. So you multiply all of them, you get all the powers, but then you only multiply together m to the fourth with m to the... 32 and 1 into 64. Are you guys comfortable with what I'm saying? Hands up so I can see. Okay, good. So there's faster ways to multiply this than doing it a hundred times. Yet solving this equation is faster than that. How can I solve this equation? There's a problem in this equation. Right? The pi star, the one that I need is in both sides. This is not the equation ax equals b solve for x. That I know how to solve, right? I multiply with A inverse of A, or I do a pseudo inverse or something, I get X. This is not that. The, I mean, I can write it as pi star times M minus identity matrix equals zero. I don't think that helps. Anybody has any idea how can I solve this? M is a matrix, pi star is a vector. The vectors that have the property V times uh, a constant uh, scalar equal V times a matrix are very special vectors for that matrix. V has to be an eigenvector of, of M. The, the, if you not familiar or if you don't remember linear algebra, this is something that, again, as a data scientist, you have to know how it works. But if you not, the, the intuition of this is this. When you multiply a matrix with a vector, you usually change the direction of the vector. So you look at the vector, it goes this way. Multiplying with a matrix usually changes the direction of the vector and the size. Uh, there's rotation matrices that only change the direction but leave the vector to the size that it is, right? But very likely, when you multiply a vector, you look at vector V, here's V. When you multiply it, Vm has a different uh, direction. What this equation says is that when I multiply V with M, I'm not changing its direction because the scalar here ensures this is the same direction as V, is just bigger or smaller in that dimension. I don't think you can see anything from there. Can you? Okay, maybe move to the front. Uh, it's up to you. If you don't like to see, that's fine. Um, so the, the eigenvectors have this special property, geometrically speaking. They do not change direction when they get multiplied with that matrix. Only eigenvectors have this property. And the scalar, that makes this work, it's called eigenvalue. So I need the vector that corresponds to which eigenvalue. There's no number here. One, so this is the eigenvector that corresponds to the eigenvalue of one. Now this equation is ill-defined because uh, 
I need to use another property. There's not enough information here. There's something about this pi star that I have to take into account. It's not any vector. It has to, all these pi's sum to, sum to one. It's a distribution. So I need that constraint in there to be able to solve it. And I can solve it with something like um, Lagrangian multipliers, for example, or, or I can do the eigenvector decomposition and use it that way. There are many mathematical ways I can compute this pi star directly. Faster than forcing it round by round, which I can do in the simulation. One of the exercises we have, I'm not sure we're going to have it now, is here's a toyish graph like this one, or if a little bit more complicated. Compute the pi star in two ways. One way is by starting the initial distribution and compute pi 1, pi 2, pi 3 until it converges. The other one, extract the eigenvector for the eigenvalue 1 and see if you get the same result. Okay, that was a fast 15 minutes of Markov chains recap. So how does this whole thing has to do with page rank, right? We're going to talk about this more next time, but what's the page rank formula? So let's, let's look at that graph there, say, and how do we measure the page rank Page rank of say um, C. Page rank is a recursive definition. That's why it's very similar to this. The intuition of page rank is importance of C. It has to do with um, uh, some sort of sum over all other nodes of importance of that node times probability of moving from X to C. That's, that's uh, the definition in English. It's not a mathematical definition, but that's what page rank is trying to capture. He's saying, how likely people are to visit a certain web page? Well, it has to do with where those people are times how likely is from them to move from where they are to that page by clicking on links. So there's no uh, secret that page rank was designed in the same way Markov chains applies to all these examples we give, whether it's traveling or airplanes or military strategies or games or, or classes that you take. The people who thought of page rank, uh, Sergey, what's his name, Green and Barry Page, right? They have this famous paper in 1998. They thought exactly this way. I want to measure the importance of a web page independent of its content just by how it's hooked up from other pages. So they felt this is a recursive notion. For a page to be important, there has to be important pages that have a good chance to sending users from them to this page. In other words, there is a high chance of people on this page, other important pages, navigating, clicking to a link that leads here. So that's exactly how they thought about it. And no surprise by thinking this way, they obtained a mark of chain kind of strategy. So, but what are those things? Well, we're going to call this importance page rank. So that's the sum of all the other pages of importance. What's importance now? Page rank of x, right? And what is the probability of from x moving to c? Unless I have a predefined transition matrix, unless somebody tells me, say, by reinforcement learning or statistical measurements, Google knows who moves from one page to the other if the page is related to them. Unless you know what this probability is, if you don't know what you're going to do. Which is one, this is one out of outgoing links from 
X. X. Right, because the situation here is X. It has a link to my page C, but it has many other links, perhaps. So this out degree of X, because it's one over that. So if I use this kind of definition for page rank, following the story I just told you, uh, I could implement it exactly as a Markov chain, because that's what it is. I have a transition matrix that's fixed this one over the out of degrees, right? It's actually the same exact properties I've been using here. I start with a distribution of users in my uh, uh, graph, web graph, and I can run my Markov chain algorithm, and who's going to be the page rank? At the very end, page rank is what in this board is page rank on the right side. The analogy works exact. Probabilities are exactly one over all degrees. Transition work exactly like that. You have to move agents according to those properties. But what what variable in here is going to be the page rank in the end? By star. Because this is exactly the equilibrium state where the, uh, the, the probability, the, the distribution doesn't change. Right? So page rank will be the pi star from the other board. Of course, page rank made a big splash when it came. A lot of people in industry and academia thought, wow, that's a spectacular idea, and it was. That's a, an amazing thing, you know. Uh, it made Google not only technically more, more, more um, desirable for people, with, with people working in algorithms and networking and theory, appreciate a lot this kind of contribution. So they, they, they immediately single out Google. You don't know, but the companies back then, like Alta Vista, they were not thought as being uh, theoretical at all. People thought of uh, search engines like Alta Vista as being a bunch of hacks put together, uh, not, not, not fundamentally grounded. So there's a lot of disrespect in academia from theoretical groups to, they, we didn't call them data companies back then, we just called them profiteers or so. But when Google came with this approach, a lot of people in academia, especially, were like, okay, well, that's something serious, that's more mathematical, that we like that approach, so on and so forth. It also made it more, more, um, um, you know, if you are CNN or, or some other company in business and you want to allow a search engine to work with you, like, in a discrete manner, uh, you would choose Google, although Alta Vista, because they have a presentation where they can, you know, uh, show off mathematics and uh, the other guys can't. I can tell you that by now everybody knows page rank made very little difference in the quality of results. But initially, it was a huge market tool for Google to present, to showcase their abilities versus the old search engines. It is true, however, that Google used links much more than the competition. So that is true. Alta Vista was you guys on homework one. Pure content, right? Check for the keywords, add up the frequencies, create a score, that kind of thing. They did not pay enough attention to links. Now links matter a lot, not as much as page rank. Although page rank values are decent uh, priors in terms of importance if you, at some point they were public. You can tell what are high page rank pages. They make sense. But they didn't contribute that much to the user rankings as, as Google think or said. There is a wrinkle to page rank. We can't just use this. This might get us stuck. So when we really try to model a uh, user moving through the web graph and really clicking and navigating to another page, we have to allow for the possibility of jumping around. Because users sometimes, they don't follow a link. They just go to the URL box and just type a new URL, right? So how can I add in here 
teleportation. I want 85% of the time to follow limbs and 50% of the time to jump. Right? I could say I, I, I want normally follow links, but every once in a while users will just change their mind and go to a totally different page that has nothing to do with where they were. So let's assume that's random, a random page. How can I now modify the formula? Page rank of some page C. The probability of moving there, it's 85% that right, is the sum of all x of page rank of x times the probability of moving from x to c plus 15% of the time, what's my chance of, by chance, reaching that page, you know, every once in a while, 15% of the time, we use to say, I'm going to go to a random page. What's the chance to hit C? Mm -hmm. One, One over, over. Number, number, of number of nodes. So here's a question for you to solve in two days. Is this still a Markov chain thing? If I want to, I want to, still I need to solve for the stationary distribution here. Can I write this in this way? There is some sort of distribution, the page rank pages. And if at time t there's a distribution, then I can obtain the page rank at time t plus 1 by simulation by just multiplying the all page rank values in a vector with the transition matrix. What I'm asking is, Obviously, this cannot be the transition matrix in the graph because I have this teleportation 15%. What I'm asking is, can I modify the transition matrix, do something to it, yeah. such that when I run this pi t plus 1 is pi t times n, I'm getting exactly that? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's like learning by itself. Like but mathematically of speaking, I need to write this equation as page rank as a vector at time uh, t plus 1 as a vector, that's over all pages, is the page rank at time t times a mem. My question is, what is this m? This cannot be the same m. I have to change it a little bit. Add 15% on the diagonal or somewhere? So. 15% of uniformity plus 85% of the original. Right. So why don't you guys think about that on paper? What do you need to do to the M for the math to work out? Because if the math works out, I can still compute the stationary distribution the same way like with, with regular Markov chains, but I have a different transition matrix now. So that's page rank, and next time we need to talk a little bit more. I don't have anything else right now. I know it's a little early. Uh, maybe, maybe, um, let's look at the schedule a little bit. When is homework three due? This Thursday. This Thursday? Okay, that's probably going to be too fast for you guys. So let's assume this week is homework 3. Homework 4 has to happen by next week. So I think it's already available. See it here. Uh, in homework four, um, in homework four, so I have to say two things before we leave. One is this is homework four, and we talked a little bit of page rank. But there's other things that you have to implement. Um, 
and we have to talk about these other algorithms, they similar to page rank, they try to capture importance by the web graph, not by content. One is called hits, and one is called salsa. Salsa, maybe an unfortunate name, there's so many things that are called salsa, but there's another one. Uh, so we talk about those two algorithms next time. And then some of them, you'll have two data sets of, uh, of uh, graph, two graphs. One is your crawl, that you have to extract the web graph of it. That's going to be difficult because you get a very incomplete web graph. But then we have another graph using academic uh, papers that you can play with. It, and we know the answer, so you can do that. Uh, another thing, I feel like it's very tempting and very easy to get ahead with the lectures compared to the homeworks. Because I can only talk a little bit, and you have a week of work. And then I can talk again a little bit, and you have another week of work. I don't want to do that. I don't want to disconnect the lectures with the homeworks. If we need another day, we can easily take another day for homework three, say. But I may have to sacrifice a lecture to make, say, office hours or some question answering or some demos. Because I don't want to end up with a situation when you guys work on homework three, and I'm already talking in class about things that are way out of homework three. In my opinion, in my experience, that's not a good thing for you guys to work on the crawls. And some dude in front of the class talks about you know, machine learning and stuff. So that, because, because it's easy to disconnect that way. So if we end up in that situation, which I feel like I'm already a little bit ahead of the, where the homeworks are, we may kill a lecture and do some demo or talk about some fancy crawler or something that's at least related. To the, to, the, to the schedule, okay? Uh, so we'll, do, we'll probably do web algorithms next uh, time, Wednesday, but the truth is hits and salsa will only take us half an hour or so to do. So instead of moving to the next module, I'll probably talk about some academic papers about crawlers or, or, or web graphs or some other graph uh, algorithms that might be interesting rather than moving to the next module, okay? Office hours go good? We happy with the office hours? Let me ask them directly. Do, do you feel like the TAs have the answers you're looking for? Or you think not? Um, I, I guess I got one thing for like two hours and it didn't go well. It didn't go well, but it got sold? Yeah. It's still unsolved? It's still unsolved. What is the issue? Um, it's related to probabilities with the uh, homework one. The probabilities for the uh, it was like the LM class and the uh -huh. judgments. and then we looked at it for like two hours and we're like I don't know your code looks great. Oh, you didn't get results. Your question was not conceptual about. Oh, it's not theoretical. You know. It was why it's not working. Yeah. And no, what's no, your answer? No, nobody knows. No, no, no. But what what's the performance? Um, well, it's like a pretty good idea. It's fine for the 25, but for the probabilities, it's still off. And I like even penalize it when it was missing words and stuff, and it's still like, I don't think it's. So, so that's for all language models? No, just the probability ones. Just, or just the. Um, right, the language models samples. all have Laplace and Jellymate, right? Yeah, just those two. So, how much are you getting? Uh, it's like 2. Point 0.2? Yeah, like 0.2. Oh, oh. Point 0.02? Yeah, zero two. So 0 0.02 yeah. or 0 0.2? 0 0.02. OK, so that's low enough to be easy to debug. There was a, I mentioned this last week. There was somebody in class had this problem, yeah. exactly that. Um, and he was here. If you're around, I'll stop by. But sure. Guys, the guys in the room. Yeah. Uh, the hard part, I, I, I said this in class a few times, the hard ones to debug when you get, you need 0.15, right? Yeah. When you get 0.13, yeah. that's hard because you're doing something right. But 0.02 or 0.03, it means it's pretty much random. Yeah. Most of the time, that's due to not accounting properly for terms that do not appear in documents. Mm -hmm. So when a term does not appear in document, mm -hmm. in, in, in vector space model, if you say, don't do nothing, yeah. Yeah. it's okay. 
because zero is the right neutral factor for most of them. Yeah. But in language models, mm -hmm. by not doing anything, zero is actually the biggest value you could get in language models because for log of something to be zero, that something has to be one. Yeah. So I mentioned this in class at least three times. That this kind of error in language models most of the time is produced by I'm ignoring somewhere in my code the terms that are not appear in the document. And instead of using a smoothed probability that's low and logarithm of it creates a large negative value, I'm not doing nothing, so I'm essentially adding zero, which is the biggest reward possible. Yeah, I, I added the, I went the other way on it. I did like a, I gave it like a log of 100 or something if I missed it. Minus, log of, log of something that's so minus 100. So, what would it, it, would, it would end up being like 4 point something as a value? Yeah, but it's not log of 100. You need to add a large negative value when you don't see it, not the positive one. Because you sort by positives, because right that's the, yeah. So this is if it if it doesn't find the term, give it a give it a positive value instead of a negative value. But otherwise, it gets a negative value. But then, when you sort, you sort by high values to top. Uh -huh. Low value. Well, that's no good because if you find the term, yeah, you gonna the more you find it, the higher the count, the higher the probabilities. The value you add is gonna be higher, not smaller. Mm -hmm. So how about we look together at the thing? Yeah. Uh, Wednesday? Are you around? Yeah. Wednesday or Thursday, take your pick. Wednesday's good. Wednesday has to be not right before the class. Anytime is on Thursday. So Wednesday has to be like 2 or 3 p.m.? Yeah. And Wednesday. you can bring, we can ask the TA who look at your code to be around. There is a couple of them. Or Thursday at regular office hours, whenever we have office hours at 6. I'll, I'll be here Wednesday before the class in the afternoon. Uh -huh. Also Thursday at office hours, you can take your pick. I'll just say Thursday at office hours, okay. it's easier. It's not, uh, don't worry about delays or penalties. Yeah, we yeah, solve yeah. it out, but most of the time, I, I've taught the class 10 years, so, uh, and I'm yeah. telling you, language yeah. model 0.0 0 .0 something, uh -huh. are close by okay, so in the when a term does not appear in the document, so yeah. how the uh, score changes. So, yeah. Yeah. It can be zero, I think it can be. has to be a large yeah. negative value. Yeah. And then so sort by positive values. Like there's, no, there's nothing positive, but the highest values are the top. So try that. Try to add, if you add the value before the log, add 2 at minus 100. So when you take the log, it's minus 100. If you add values after the log, just add minus 100 to it. And then sort by high values at the top. This, I don't know how you remember that, but basically, if you just send that you want to do it, so, okay, when, when you add those probabilities in language models, right, let me, let me just give you something without looking at code. Right. Is what? Some of the terms in the query, right, is the log of the probability of that term in the document, right? Okay. So, if a term is not up here, it's in the document. Okay. You want to say, okay, it does not appear, and instead of all these logs, I'm going to give it so minus a Because then you still want to sort by all the values will be negative, but this will be minus 1.5, this will be minus 1.7, minus 1.9. This will be the stuff that didn't miss any term. Okay. As soon as you see something so missing a term, mm -hmm. that will be at least minus 100, because you okay. put the minus 100 from your pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Everything here is negative. Mm -hmm. Log of probability will always be negative. Yeah. Yeah. It makes more sense when you write it down. Do you want to take a picture? Yeah. Yeah. Try this out. Maybe we don't need to. I mean, I'll be there anyway. Yeah. Not tomorrow. Yeah, I just, it, it, it was like, you know, we, we, tr we definitely tried for a couple of hours and a few people looked at it. I, I know, I, I've said it in class a few times, yeah. and I've had this experience in the previous terms. Yeah. And maybe that's not yeah. your problem, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But in my experience, yeah. most of the 0, 0. something so is probably, precisely yeah. this issue. Yeah, I'll try it. Yeah, thanks. Sure. So, the thing is in Wikipedia, you will 